Okay, and we're on. That, that worked. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like we we we're kind of knowing what we're doing. Yeah, <laughs> practice makes perfect. Almost two hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're just waiting for a special guest to join on back on again. Uh, well, good evening, everybody, <laughs> and uh, welcome back to our uh, Sunday night offering of Astronomy Every the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. Yeah. <laughs> We're back. My name is Chris Carwin. I'm the creator of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay. I'm also an amateur astronomer and a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Uh, and I promise you that I'm not sitting in a closet. I am sitting in a room, <laughs> but my wife's <laughs> view here kind of makes me look like I'm sitting in a closet. But uh, anyway, I'm very pleased to welcome back my two uh, very good co-hosts for this evening, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moonshadow Observatory in beautiful Hampton. Paul, good evening. Hello. Good evening. And my other uh, co-host, of course, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory. John, Mike. Good evening. And we'd like to welcome all of you out there tonight in YouTube and Facebook land. And, of course, all of you who have been joining us through the uh, local Rogers TV network. Thank you very much for your support. Okay, so on tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, we see that we have a special guest here this evening. A very special guest. Um, and uh, I'm going to have Paul introduce him for us. Uh, and I'm going to mention that we are, once our special guest has uh, finished this presentation, we are going to present uh, our vinyl bud. Uh, Mike will have that for us this evening. Paul's going to have another Rosanna's Fun Facts episode. I've got a little bit of a talk about a uh, couple of things that might be up in our night sky and some photos, of course, to share uh, with our wonderful photos that he had uh, sent in for us. So, Paul, I'll leave it to you, sir. All right. Our guest this evening. All right. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, well, I'm really excited about tonight's guest. Um, I got started back in astrophotography, in astronomy in general, uh, back about uh, 2010 going into 2011. And um, I didn't start with a telescope and look at the sky and figure things out, then try to take pictures. I started taking pictures right away. And uh, that's kind of what hooked me to get into this hobby. And uh, one of the one of the books that got me into this hobby, of course, is, is the Backyard uh, Astronomer's Guide. And I've got all the issues here at the house, and including the new one, of course. And uh, and a big part of that book is uh, co-author Mr. Alan Dyer. So we are extremely pleased to have Alan here tonight with us. Uh, and you can say I've always been a huge fan. So this is a thrill for me uh, tonight. But I'm going to uh, just give a, a proper introduction. So I'm just going to read a little bit of another magazine or another book that Alan uh, is associated with. And this one, of course, is uh, the Night Watch magazine. So our, our book, so it goes a little like this. So Alan is now retired. Really? <laughs> yeah. 
you work with anybody I know uh, for many rewarding years in uh, in the re in a planetarium shows for theaters in Winnipeg, in Edmonton, and in Calgary, Canada. A former editor with the Astronomy Magazine in the early 1990s, and Alan was a regular contributor to Sky News Magazine, which is just unfortunately defunct uh, and just in the, uh, the uh, near uh, past, and Sky and Telescope Magazines, frequently writing product reviews. Um, his astrophotos have been published widely online and in print uh, at spaceweather.com, NASA's astronomy picture of the day, thus known as the APOD, uh, Forbes, Universe Today, National Geographic, Time, The New York Times, NBC News, and CBS News. And in 2018, Canada Post actually featured a stamp with one of Alan's um, Aurora pictures on it, which was fantastic. And um, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And since his first TSE in February 1979, uh, Alan has traveled the world to see, get this, not one, not two, not four, not eight, 16 solar eclipses coming up to number 17 in, uh, in, uh, in April. And uh, so that's going to be amazing. And I think that's what Alan's going to be talking about tonight. And the main belt asteroid, uh, 78434, is named after Alan as well. So congratulations for that. And uh, and he's actually got an amazing website called AmazingSky.com. I spent probably the last two or three days on it, to be honest. And uh, there is so much data, so much information, and so many phenomenal inspiring photographs that you really should uh, take a look at that website. So it's amazingsky.com. Go on that site. It's absolutely wonderful. So having said all of that, um, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome to our show, Mr. Alan Dyer. Well, thank you very much, Paul, and, and uh, to, to Mike and Chris uh, for the great job you guys do hosting um, the show every week. For now, what is it, 199 episodes? <laughs> I got that right. That's amazing. Uh, it's a wonderful job, and you deserve um, your asteroid as well. And so congratulations on that recognition. That's that's great. Um but what I'm here to talk about today, and it's keeping me busy talking to a lot of different groups uh, and the like, is is something like this that you see here. This was <laughs> on a ship at sea in the South Pacific, north of Pitcairn Island in 2005. Oh. Total eclipse of the sun. And typically, of course, to see one, you've got to go to the ends of the Earth like this. This is one of the most remote locations on Earth. But next April, gosh, you can just watch it from your backyard in new brunswick or drive an hour or something whatever it was i mean that's incredibly rare and and you want to you want to get into that path well that's the topic and i'm, I'm going to talk more, more more about that as we get into the talk so that's the topic tonight but particularly how to photograph it in ways that are simple um uh, that we're going to want to do as amateur astronomers because you don't want to miss seeing it you don't want to pay all your attention to all your camera gear. And so that's the topic tonight. So if I can, I'll just share the screen here and get underway. Oh, where are we here? There, there, whoops. There it is. There it is. Okay. There we go. Okay. Hopefully we're set. Yeah, it looks good. I'll say. All right, great. Uh, and so it's I'm 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 breaking the talk into what I call ten tips, and and we'll we'll take it a few tips at a time, and we'll stop uh, along the way here to take questions and answers about what I've talked about so far. So ten tips for getting photographs of of the total solar eclipse. And these are based on a ream of advice I have on my ebook, which came out last June and uh, is selling well. And you can get it through connections, uh, links at my website, a page there. That's the website web page for the ebook, um, which has reams of information, much more than I can deal with in one, one talk like this. And so I encourage you to, to get that if you want to learn a lot more, particularly processing pictures. Big section of processing. We're not getting into that at all tonight. So um, 
the goal here today is really to, uh, as it is in the book, is to shoot great images, of course, of the eclipse from wherever you might be. And then use simple methods requiring a minimum of attention to gear and settings. And so the least can go wrong. <laughs> because believe me, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong a minute before totality. And, and so you can, you can get great pictures, but still watch it and enjoy it. Because if you've not seen one, you really do want to see it. You don't want to look at it just through the viewfinder of your camera. And like So that's the goal, some simple techniques to still get great pictures. And as, as Paul mentioned, I'm a veteran of 16. And gosh, there's, 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 I was at a talk by, by Jay Anderson. He's got like 30 <laughs> to his record. 16, Turkey in 99, Pitcairn Island I mentioned in 2005, over in Antarctica in 2003, over in Nunavut, Canada in 2008. So I've seen it from the air, from the Antarctic and Arctic. Chile in 1994, Libya in 2006. Gosh, we plane to all kinds of places where tourists often don't go. And uh, it's it's that's a wonderful thing about eclipse chasing. It does take you to incredible places in the world. But in this case, next April, you know, you guys can stay at home almost and watch it, or we can just stay here in North America. This is the path. I'm not going to go into all the technical details of the eclipse. Gosh, that's all over the place. This map is from greatamericaneclipse.com, and you can get all kinds of detailed maps from Michael Zeiler's website there. But as I'm, as I'm pointing out, there it is right over New Brunswick. Well, the very path is on your T-shirt. It's on your group photo. And, and so you, you have to be in that path of totality. If you're just outside the path, you'll see 99% or partial or 98, whatever. That's not good enough. You got you get yourself into the path. There's no such thing as 98% total eclipse. It's a world of difference, night and day, literally. So you've got to be in that path, make the effort, whatever it takes to drive, whether it's an hour or whether it's five days it's going to take me to go down to Texas. Make the effort to get into the path of totality. You don't want to say, ah, I'll see the next one. No, it'll be 20 <laughs> years before the next one is in North America here. Um, maybe if you're an Eclipse fan, you saw the annular eclipse in 2023 last October as an annular eclipse. If you went to the path of annularity for that one, uh, or, or maybe you saw it to partial and you stayed at home. Either way, it was a dress rehearsal for testing your equipment, testing under pressure of time that the eclipse is not going to wait for you <laughs> and to get the equipment set up right. It's going to happen regardless, especially during to a total eclipse where you got four minutes or three minutes, whatever. It's going to start whether you're ready or not. And testing for vibration and sharpness that everything technically is working fine and perfecting your focusing. I'm going to deal with these, these tips as we go along here. So that was a good dress rehearsal. But believe me, it was a shadow of the full effect of what a total eclipse will be, even if you were in the path of annularity. It got darker. It was neat. It was weird. But it wasn't a total eclipse. It's a huge difference. Because only in a total eclipse do we see that corona where the moon is now big enough to completely hide the bright photosphere of the sun. And we see that corona. And you see more or less what I'm showing here, red prominences. It's an incredible sight that you've got only three or four minutes to appreciate, enjoy, or photograph. Photographing an eclipse like this can be one of the easiest astrophotos to take, or it can be one of the most difficult <laughs> if you get too ambitious. And the effort can prevent you from seeing the eclipse. And that would be the worst crime, as it were. Coming away, not with pictures that have you know, not worked out right. Okay, because there'll be lots of pictures, but not having seen the eclipse. And so my final tip will be, you know, just watch uh, the eclipse. And so um, this is my tips for tonight. I'm just going to itemize them and then we'll get into each of them. Test your filters. Practice removing the filters. Don't use a long focal length telescope. Use a tracking mount if you are going for longer focal lengths. Consider a wide angle image and a wide angle time lapse. I'll explain what that is. Considering a close up movie or even just shooting with your phone camera. And then practice and practice and practice and then make a list and checking it twice uh, as well. Because as happened to me, the annual clips, I forgot one key piece of equipment and it 
mess up my plans because uh, <laughs> I didn't thoroughly check my list. So I'll deal with the first couple of tips about filters and we'll, then we'll see if there's, you know, questions and whatnot as we go along here. But gosh, you're going to need a solar filter for the partial phases of the total eclipse, not for totality, as I'll explain in a minute. But you need it for all the partial phases, as you did for the annular eclipse or any partial eclipse. You might have those. As an amateur astronomer, you might have those, and you're set. You're fine. But if you're going to do, be doing photography, maybe you don't have one for the telescope you plan to use or the lens or whatever. Or after tonight's talk, you might think, oh, I could use this lens. I don't have a filter for it. Get it right away. In 2017, these things were going for hundreds of dollars scalped. You know, they were hard to find. And so get them right away from your suppliers. I'll mention suppliers in a, in a couple of minutes. And for your lenses, whatever camera, lens, or telescope. And don't forget some handheld filters for your, just your eyes as well to follow the partial phases or for family members to use. So make sure you got filters for everybody as well. Get those now if you don't have them. These are some suppliers I can suggest that I've gotten filters from. Seymour Solar in the U.S. I'll show you a couple of pictures I took with their filters. Kendrick Astro here in, in, in Canada sells excellent line of filters. And then for uh, filters over camera lenses, uh, these two manufacturers, Case and Nissi, in the U.S., the U.S. divisions sell filters made for camera lenses not for telescopes but for camera lenses and i use one of the case filters at the october annular eclipse as well so you go to their websites and i've got them listed there they're hard to find these filters search for nd hundred thousand because that's what they have to be that dense nd search for that in the product search category and and they'll come up and uh, I've just learned about the Nissi one. Uh, hopefully I've got one coming uh, for one lens as well. So get those filters now from wherever you might uh, want to. They're needed for the partial phases only, but I found in my testing, which is in my ebook, glass filters or mylar filters are the best for photography. There's another type called black polymer filters, and those are fine for your eyeglasses and things like that for your, you know, your, your eclipse glasses. Those are great for naked eye views, but they tend to be kind of soft for photographic use. So the glass or mylar filters, either they screw on to a camera lens or they clamp over a camera lens or clamp over a telescope. Um, I like the, the Kendrick Botter. This is the one I use for the annual, annular eclipse. Um, it's a very nice design. It's got a little sun spotting, which is very, can be very useful. Finding the sun is actually a challenge at times. Got a little sun spotting device there attached to it. These are mylar or luminized mylar. They're very sharp and Canadian company, support Canada, Canadian company, uh, get one of the Kendrick ones, all kinds of sizes, if you don't have one now. And then get it now, and even if you, or if you've got one now, practice, test, test it. Uh, shoot a range of exposures with the equipment you intend to use to nail down what your ex proper exposure should be. Yeah, you can bracket exposures during the partial phases for sure, and you probably should do that. But nevertheless, you want to get an idea of what the proper exposure should be with the equipment that you have. And then what it might be if you're having to shoot through some cloud, you know, practice on cloudy days to see you can maybe still get something uh, through cloud. So Practice with it now to figure out what the best settings are for the partial phases. The annular eclipse in last October was great dress rehearsal. Um, and these are a couple of shots I took a wide angle time lapse shot, which I'll talk about for the total, and then a telephoto lens shot as well. And I'll talk about that as a method for the total. But in this case, you had to use the filter for the entire eclipse. Um, and so uh, uh, those worked. I used one from Case. And then the one on the right, I used a filter from Seymour Solar, which screwed onto the telephoto lens. And it, they both worked very, very well. And so if you've got had practice last October, well, great. You're that much farther ahead. But make sure the difference between last October's eclipse and the eclipse coming up, you got to take that filter off at totality or just before totality. And that can foul people up where it gets stuck. It gets jammed and you can't get it off and you're panicking because the eclipse is happening. 
And so practice removing the filters, but don't do it now when it's aimed at the sun now, because <laughs> you could damage your camera, you know, aiming the unfiltered camera at the sun. So practice removing your filters and putting them back on, especially if you've got two or three rigs that you're running. So practice with it now uh, and then figure out where you're going to put the filter as well, because you need to put it back on after totality. So you got to find it. You don't want to throw it down and get it damaged or something. So the filter, sil solar filters have to be removed for the diamond rings at the beginning and end. And technically they're before totality and after totality. So you, you, know, you don't want to remove the filter just at totality, not if you want to shoot the diamond rings, what I'm showing here on either side of the flanking the sun. So you've got to take them off about a minute or two before totality. It's not safe to look through uh, a telescope, but your camera will be fine. So, for example, this is a sequence from a movie clip in Australia in 2012 with the filter on the left there, taking the filter off, and then the camera on auto exposure just adjusted, and then boom, the next frame, a second two later, it's fine. And so that's taking the filter off and 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 then and then letting the camera continue to shoot in this case on in as a movie and so you've got to take them off just a minute or two before totality in order to get the diamond rings leave them off for the last diamond ring and then don't forget to put them back on again and so uh or turn your telescope or camera away from the sun and so for lenses you can get filters that will thread onto the front of a lens or they can clamp over the top of the lens and those can be a little easier to take off because they don't screw on types can jam on physically you know seize on to the lens and that can be a panic and so practice with that and make sure you can take them off uh this is one i used in in october for the annual clips that's uh it's a magnetic type so it just kind of clicks on to a little magnetic retaining ring so it's kind of quick and easy you don't have to screw and unscrew it off and so that's kind of neat as well uh and so that's one i used in october for the for the wide angle shot so that's the first couple of tips about filters so if there's anything coming in about filters or whatever we can stop and take some questions right now sure i'm just going to take a look here uh, at a couple of questions i think um uh, we had one question here about something else. How many total minutes in the shadow of the moon over those 16 eclipses? <laughs> oh, I've never added all that up. Uh, real dedicated <laughs> umbra files do their whatever it is their umbral time. I've never added it all up. Uh, I, sh I should do that. The longest eclipse I've seen, and maybe some people in the audience were there too, in Mexico in 1991, July 11th. 1991 it was seven minutes it was the longest eclipse of was it wow. the 20th century or the 1990 you know whatever longest eclipse of that time and i think even in the 21st century there isn't one quite as long as that as i recall wow. yeah um, had one other question can you use a uh one second can you use a hydrogen alpha uh, scope to image the eclipse Ah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. You can certainly use a hydrogen alpha scope, which you might own for looking at the partial phases and seeing where the prominences are, but not during totality. You won't see anything during totality. In, in fact, you don't need to see, uh, use a part, an H alpha scope to see the prominences. You can see them naked eye <laughs> if they're big or certainly through any telescope or binoculars. So your H alpha scope would be handy to have there to look through or to shoot through the partial phases where it's already got its filtration built in, but during totality, it'll be useless for you. Um, uh, I have a, oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, I have a question there too. Um, I want to find or ask you, because I noticed that you had mentioned during this talk or on those slides that you used um, auto um, uh, aperture, I guess, for... Yeah. I'm going to get into that in terms of techniques. There's a couple of techniques where you can just put the camera on auto exposure and it'll work fine. Yeah, and but I, I saves guess you a lot of work. The question is related to the filter uh, removal and putting it back on. Do you have to refocus? No, no. Um, that's that's covered in one of the slides. No, you don't. Not if the filters over the front of the telescope, which it has to be, or lens. Everybody thinks deep sky photographers know that if you have a filter in the path, 
in front of your camera or a filter drawer or something, you've got to refocus. That's true when the filter is between the optics and the sensor, but not when it's in, in front of the optics. It does okay. not shift the focus. Perfect. Yeah. Now I'll talk about focus because there's something else that can shift the focus. So. Okay. And then one more question here from Brad. Uh, I ordered polymer filter paper a long time ago in anticipation of this. He says, is it worth trying to get mylar instead at this point? Or is the difference minimal? Yeah. Yes. For photography, I would suggest it is. Um, the, the, the polymer paper is, is great and, and you can make a filter out of it and try it out. And, you know, if you, if you've got material and you haven't physically made the filter, you're concocting your own, well, you got to do that right away to try it out and test it. Um, but you, uh, just in testing polymer filters, I found through a telescope, the images were quite dark and soft and, and kind of not very contrasty, a lot of glow and glare. And so, but test yours because it may be different than the stuff I tried. But if you've only got the material and you haven't made a filter out of it yet, you got to do that right away. Um, but I would recommend the Mylar filters uh, for photographically. They are kind of the sharpest and most contrasty other than glass filters with their hard to find glass filters. Now, uh, some of the usual suppliers of them are not stocking them. They just can't get them from china or wherever it is they're coming from and so the glass filters are a little tougher to find um now for telescopes particularly i think that's it sir we can move on all right okay good um my this is this is for amateur astronomers because inevitably people they have a whatever schmidt can't ask grain tell oh i'm gonna take this great big telescope and conquer the world of eclipses with Nah, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> Don't use a long focal length unless you really are adamant about getting close ups of prominences and the like. I would not use, especially if you're hauling stuff a, a bit distance, a, a big long focal length telescope because with an eclipse, it's the corona, which is the star of the show. That's really what you want to shoot. I would say, and it goes out two or four degrees. I mean, you need a field of view of several degrees wide. And so don't use a really long focal length. It does complicate the, the shooting process quite a bit in terms of tracking and, and, and whatnot and vibration. Uh, this is the focal length chart here that shows you how big the field of view will be with various focal length lenses. And I think the sweet spot for a close-up there's a place for even wider angle lenses, but for a close-up is about 400 to 600 millimeter on a full frame camera. It would be even less on a crop frame camera. As you can see, if you go to like a thousand millimeter or something like that, which a telescope certainly can be, you're getting in really close. Now there's a place for that, but, but you know, you've got to be an avid eclipse shooter to worry about getting close-ups of prominences and all that stuff. Because you can kind of do those anytime with with an H alpha scope. It's the corona that is unique to the eclipse. And it can go out quite far. And it'll be quite symmetrical as well. It'll be extending out in all directions around the sun at this eclipse because it's near maximum. So don't I, I find a short focal length refractor, Apple refractor of 600 ish, 400 to 600 ish millimeter is kind of ideal for telescopic close ups. And so there we go. Uh, and just avoid the great big long thousand millimeter focal lengths. But as I show on the left, if you're using a telephoto lens and you can uh, just just untracked on a tripod, make sure that tripod is solid. And I like a geared head so you can adjust it and aim it precisely because the sun is going to keep moving. And suddenly, just before the eclipse, you realize it's not framed properly and you have a difficult time framing it. And suddenly the eclipse has started and you're not ready. And so one of these geared tripod heads can really help you precisely position and frame and compose your image. Uh, if you're using the longer the focal length, the more that's important. So don't worry about long focal lengths. But focus is the key thing. Fuzzy images from vibration from something bouncing around a weak tripod or poor focus just not being in focus, that's the major cause of poor eclipse pictures. Uh, poor exposure, everybody fusses about the right, the right exposure. There is no one right exposure, but there is one proper focus. It needs to be sharp. And as 
we were just saying, the focus will not change when you remove the filter for totality. So you can focus before totality on the crescent sun or a sunspot or the cusp of the sun and get it sharp because it is important to kind of focus not just not long before totality at the beginning of the eclipse certainly but also later on because the temperature is going to change it's going to warm up in the morning but it could cool off as the eclipse happens it will and that temperature change can shift the focus especially with long telephoto lenses and telescopes so what was in sharp focus at the beginning of the eclipse an hour later is not so refocus just before or whatever a few minutes before totality through the filter on what you can see of what's left of the sun and get it sharp because that's that's going to ruin more pictures is not having it sharp uh and so take your time to focus and just a, while we're here in terms of settings for these kinds of still pictures through telescopes or tele or telephoto lenses always shoot raw uh for DS, dslm or dslr cameras don't use mirror lockup because that can complicate the process. Just use live view and you can see the image of the, the eclipse happening on your live view screen. For mirrorless cameras, uh, electronic first cut, first curtain shutter helps reduce vibration a bit more. And then what I have been doing and recommend is you can set up your camera to automatically take a bracketed set of exposures. So you don't have to keep adjusting the exposure every shot you can automatically take seven or nine, depends on the camera shots, so many stops apart, one stop apart, something like that. So one press of the shutter and it goes bang, 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 and takes a whole range of exposures for you automatically. And 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 you can, you can be watching it or looking at it through another telescope, which I'll show you. And so that can help automate the sequence as well. And you can put that auto exposure bracketing on a custom shooting mode. Almost all cameras have this where you can assign it. So you just go to C1 or C2 or whatever it is called in your camera and it's set up automatic. what well, you set it up beforehand, but you automatically sets up all those settings that you need and make sure you practice with it to make sure it is correct. And and so one click of the dial sets, you know, half a dozen different settings on your camera. And that's a great way to take a range of exposures very easily and quickly without you having to fuss with a camera for every single exposure. But for the diamond rings, you don't want a whole range of exposures. One exposure, very short like a two thousandth of a second is all you need for the diamond rings and the prominences. So you want to take those very quickly, a whole bunch of short shots very, very quickly in rapid succession. And all cameras have a high speed continuous mode. You can assign that to a custom mode. It's what I'm going to do for the diamond rings either end and then the other custom mode for the shots during totality to take rapid fire shots of the diamond rings uh, as you know, as rapidly as the camera will do that while you hold down the shutter button, but practice with that uh, as well. So that's one way you can take the diamond rings and get a whole sequence because it changes very rapidly from that big diamond ring down to the official start of totality where all you're left is with the red chromosphere and the whatever prominences are jutting out at that time. And then if you're shooting with a longer focal length, you could certainly use a tracking mount. Uh, you can get great shots with just a camera on a tripod, but as amateur astronomers, we probably have mounts that can track the sky, uh, portable little trackers like this, uh, or bigger mounts. But for the longer focal lengths, several hundred millimeters, a telescope, using a tracking mount really is an advantage because now it allows longer exposures without blurring the image because the, the whole sky is moving, as we know. And exposure is longer than a fraction of a second, quarter of a second, something like that. That whole image is going to move as the sun and moon move together across the sky, blurring the image. So if you want to go for the really long exposures to get the outermost corona or even the earth shine on the dark side of the moon, as I show here, uh, a tracking mount really helps keep the sun centered. Good composition later for blending the exposures. They aren't moving. You, they stay aligned. And really kind of essential if you do intend to shoot with quite long focal lengths, some sort of tracking mount, a little tracker or, you know, an equatorial mount for a telescope or whatever. 
these little trackers are great, but they can be shaky because they're made for wide angle lenses. They'll work for the telephotos, but you know, if you're handling the camera and adjusting it, they can bounce around and the shake and the vibration will spoil your picture. So practice with that, with the kind of lens you, you intend to use, as I'll say at the end on the moon, to see that you can use that tracker and get sharp shots with it without it bouncing around and being shaky. And they need polar alignment during the day. How do you do that? Angle it at the right angle, aim it due north as, as best you can and practice with that now to see how well. It doesn't have to track perfectly, just needs to keep the sun centered for a few minutes. And so you polar alignment doesn't have to be precise, but it's got to, you still have to polar align it reasonably roughly. And you can practice with that now to see that you can do that. And the sun or sun or the moon at night, the sun during the day will stay in the frame for several minutes. It, it certainly should. But practice with that now using the tracker with the gear. And of course, you can go to a full fledged equatorial mount like this. Uh, which we probably all have as amateur astronomers, and and you may use that combination with the telescope that you use use now, and that's that's great. But practice with it going to be set to the latitude you're going to be at. It might be home. If you're in New Brunswick, fine. But if you're going to New Mexico or 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 uh, Texas rather, or Mexico or whatever, uh, practice with it that lower latitude to make sure nothing collides. Uh, and then also aimed in the direction the sun's going to be, you know, high in the south as well, that you don't have a surprise on eclipse morning. You realize something isn't doesn't want to go where you want it to because some component is colliding. And then these two mounts in particular, I pick them out, but other mounts have the issue as well, where the sun from Texas and Mexico is going to be due south at, during totality. Some of these mounts stop tracking when they aim due south of the meridian. And you don't want to find that a minute before totality or during totality, or even after totality, if you want to continue to track to take a time-lapse sequence of the partial phases. So check that your mount will track through the meridian if the eclipse is going to be due south from your site. That won't be the case in Eastern Canada, but it will be from the Southern US and Mexico. So, you know, things like that can surprise you on eclipse morning that you didn't uh, didn't anticipate yeah i like to use dual telescopes one to shoot through and i can look at the at, at the eclipse on the on the screen of the camera and live view but a separate little telescope piggyback on it to, just to look through so i can look and shoot at the same time you really want that telescopic view of the eclipse it's just to die for it's just that you'll see details with your eye the camera will not capture as 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 sophisticated a techniques as we can use and as good as the cameras are you will see stuff better with your eye than what the pictures will show probably and so you want to have this and there's a setup a kind of similar to what i use in 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 october last year here is 1998 in curacao at latitude 12 degrees north or something same telescope my eclipse telescope the four inch astrophysics traveler different piggybacked visual scope but there it's, there's my same setup for the total eclipse in february 1998 in curacao um and so that's a nice combination of gear or frac you know a refractor to shoot through and a smaller one don't need a big one smaller one piggybacked on it but make sure it balances make sure it works make sure it's solid nothing's going to you know come loose or whatever uh and so practice with that so again, we can stop here about telescopes and I'm going to get into other kinds of pictures without telescopes, wide angle stuff next. But, you know, that those last couple of tips dealt with the sort of techniques most of us amateur astronomers are going to want to use with long focal lengths. Okay. Um, uh, there weren't any questions really about that particular section, but in general comments, uh, I had one here from Mitch. Uh, where do you figure is the best place on its path to view based on probably the cloud cover? <laughs> that's, that's a magic question. Well, yeah. you can you can go to Jay Anderson's website. Oh, he's a meteorologist uh, in at the Winnipeg RSC um, in the Winnipeg RSC. He does all the eclipse weather predictions. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting what it is. Eclipser.ca? I'm forgetting what it is. But um, he's got all the weather predictions, and that's what everybody faithfully follows. And uh, Mexico is the place to be 
for the best guarantee of clear skies or even offshore in a, in a ship, you know, in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and then it gets worse as you go north. Uh, even in Texas, it's still 50-50 oh, really? for the chances of clear skies. And it gets worse as you go north. And you know better than I what it's like in your area. Yeah. But that said, eclipses can be very different. And what happens on eclipse day can be completely the opposite of what the climate trends suggested. And sure. and this last year on April 8th, everybody in that cloudy track uh, in the northern part of the track would have seen it. And Texas was cloudy. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. So, yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, uh, I know back in uh, 2021, I guess. We, I mean, we had a, a morning eclipse, and uh, the sky the night before was just incredibly bad. And uh, we woke up that morning; it was really cold. We woke up that morning, went out, and uh, just for an hour, the sky parted just enough, just more like a sucker hole for us to be able to view it, and then to glide it back up again. So you never really know, I guess. Uh, that point. No, ne never give up, um, because as you say, it you can you can get a a view you know miraculously um but even even if you you get some light cloud you might still see the diamond rings and the prominences you might not see the outer corona or the corona but you'll see see some aspect of a to to totality through through some cloud right but also be prepared to drive at the last minute or last hour to get a clear hole in the sky yeah. down the highway someplace as long right. as the highway's open and not jammed with people and right. so lots of people have have been able you know have gotten eclipses by chasing at the last minute out of the 16 eclipses i've seen only a handful were seen from the spot where we originally intended to be yeah. um okay. we might have only moved a few miles down the road or on a ship like this we might have been as you can see here, moving into a clear hole in this in this in the sky um, uh, to, to get into that clear hole that the captain could see down further down the track. And right. so that's the success is try to keep mobile. And and I would suggest as well, if, you know, you might set up a whole array of gear and then, oh, my gosh, you can't unpack it, you know, pack it up again and head off. And so judge accordingly if it looks like you're gonna to have to move the last minute keep your gear choice to very simple have a very simple contingency setup that you could set up literally in five minutes and be taking some pictures or if not just look with the binoculars and go. and uh so you know you get locked into a site with all your gear set up and then suddenly you know clouds move in and you could have seen it if you'd only moved 10 miles down the road right. but you're you're locked in because you're committed to a site or with too much gear set up. Um, Alan, I've got a question regarding the telescopes. Actually, it's a question for those who maybe have never shot an eclipse. I think that would be probably the majority of people. Would you recommend a camera and a telephoto lens or a telescope and a camera combination? Well, if you're familiar with shooting through a telescope uh, and you do that now with the moon or sun, then great, you're, you're, you're ahead of the game. But otherwise, a, a, a camera and a telephoto lens uh, is good for people that are just, you know, don't have much familiarity with astrophotography or shooting through a telescope. Don't use gear that you've just concocted together for the eclipse that you're not familiar with. Um, if you do intend it, then practice now with it. But otherwise, a camera and a telephoto lens is fully capable of getting excellent shots. The key thing is on a solid tripod. Not some flimsy lightweight thing that's just going to bounce around. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess the reason for that question is for those who maybe don't have a telescope but do have a camera and a, and a lens, then you really don't need to buy any other equipment to capture this. Um, uh, other than the filter, other than the filter. Other filter. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, good, that's true. Now I'm going to give you a couple more options coming up in here for people with just a camera and a lens, but not telephoto lenses. So that's next. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Now, I'm, I'll thank, say thanks to Paul Gray out here for uh, mentioning uh, eclipsofile.com. Apparently, that's the page. Eclipsofile.com. Yes, thank you very much. That's that's um, Jay's Jay's site, and so go there for all the weather predictions. Okay. Now, something I always do at every eclipse because it's easy to do. So I always have a camera set up to do this. Is the wide angle image. 
Uh, and it's, it's easy to do with a minimum of effort. The camera can be doing the shots for you. You just have to set it up properly and get it going a few minutes before totality. But you don't have to do anything during totality. And so a wide angle uh, image like this, much simpler to shoot with a minimum of effort. But you do have to frame it properly. From Texas, the sun's going to be up quite high, so it takes a pretty wide-angle lens to get it and the landscape below. If you've got a landscape below you want, want to include, Texas, it's up pretty high. Uh, Southern Ontario, it's down lower. It's later in the afternoon, down lower. You don't need as wide a lens, but from where you guys are, it's down. It's actually better for this kind of picture. Sun's down lower, late afternoon. You don't need as wide a lens. You, the sun can be a little bit bigger, 35 or 28 on a full frame camera will frame the scene nicely. If you've got a nice foreground to include the foreground could be your family, whatever. Um, and, uh, but, but you've got to frame it properly and you can use software that we use sky safari, stellarium set up field of view indicators, set it up for the day and time and location you're going to be and see what the framing would be. And, uh, and then frame it accordingly. Then you can, instead of taking one shot, the way to do this is actually take hundreds of shots, get the camera going on an interval timer, and you create a time lapse like I've just showed you there. Hopefully, it's coming through, where it's like several hundred shots, and the camera is just taking those by itself to turn into a time lapse movie, and and you get the sweep of the of the moon shadow. I'm just repeating it here. You get the sweep of the moon shadow coming in from the right uh, here, and there it goes whoosh. And now you're in the moon shadow, you see the total eclipse, and then it wishes out again. In this case, a U.S. Air Force jet was vainly trying to chase the <laughs> moon shadow. And you get the horizon colors, the twilight glows as well. Now, as I say, it can take quite a wide angle lens if you're going down to the southern U.S. or Tex uh, Texas or Mexico. Um, but frame it as per planetarium software, manually focus, don't use autofocus, manually focus on a distant thing. No filter, uh, at least for the whole shooting sequence, but cover the lens until it's needed. You don't want to aim the camera at the sun for the whole partial phases. So either filter or cover it. And then just uncover it five minutes before totality, whatever. And use auto exposure with wide area sampling, so it's not spot metering. It's taking their whole exposure reading for a big chunk of the of the field. And I usually like to underexpose by about minus one stop, and then use an intervalometer either into the camera or a separate one, and take a shot every second, one a second, and you'll get several hundred shots. But the the exposure will change automatically by the camera. And as it did in the sequence I showed you there, started a few minutes before totality, and then don't forget to stop it <laughs> after totality. Don't start partying and forget all your stuff and stop it a few minutes after totality, after the shadow has gone away and cover the lens, point it away from the sun, whatever. But for the few minutes, either side of totality, it's perfectly safe to look at, you know, have it aimed at the sun. And you get a nice sequence that you can turn into a time lapse or extract individual raw files from to turn into a still picture, like in the background here. And, uh, and you get a nice shot of the environment. Really the way your eye and your mind remembers seeing it. And it's one of the best shots you can get that records the eclipse in your environment, your sight, and the way your eye, that naked eye impression. That's always, I find, the most compelling and the most memorable. So that's an easy way to do it. Or my, and I'll have another camera going, is the plan, who knows, with a little tighter framing, no landscape, tighter framing uh, around the sun, because we have Venus and Jupiter flanking it, and and hopefully this coronal streamer is going out if it's on perfectly clear sky and then there's a comet going to be there as well but i don't think it'll show up but you never know and and uh and then just again the camera going automatically just started a few minutes before totality and just let it run but this case framing in a little closer to get the planets either side set in the deep blue sky with the corona so that's an alternative which i'm gonna i think my prime shot for next for this this eclipse is that shot if i do nothing else but this i'll be happy and so that's an alternative that once again you don't have to babysit the camera during totality you can just watch uh so 
All right, wide angle shots. Anything about that technique? It's a little different. It's not what most people think of, but it actually is a very effective. And uh, no uh, questions so far. Just waiting to go ahead, Paul. Yeah, no, I'll ask a question, uh, Lewis. Uh, some people, because I know some people will be wondering. So, when you're suggesting using exposure compensation, I'm I'm assuming that you're using some kind of automated program. You're not totally. No, 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 no. No, just the camera. You can always set every camera to automatically under. It's on auto exposure, but you can offset it right. to underexpose by one stop or overexpose. But I underexpose by one stop roughly. So uh, the it just doesn't blow out the corona quite as much because it, it is technically overexposing the corona. Yeah. And so I'm not using any automation software. I know people are going to wonder about that. But for that kind of technique, you don't. The camera's auto exposure and the interval timer is handling it all for you. Yeah. So basically, the camera's in either program mode or automatic. And then you're just using exposure compensation down by one stop, as you say. And that should do the job for you. Yeah. Use aperture priority so that the aperture stays the same, the ISO stays the same, ISO 100 low but the camera is varying the exposure lengthening it lengthening it lengthening it but it typically never gets longer than about a second mm -hmm. and so one second interval is fine and even if it misses a few that's fine and and then it will gradually shorten the exposure so it's varying the shutter speed the iso and the aperture stay fixed perfect so what you said what you said okay all right excellent like another another yeah. option is to shoot a, a movie. We all have the cameras that can shoot movies. In this case, I'm shooting a movie through my DSLR, through a telephoto lens. I took the filter off there, and the camera's on auto exposure, aperture priority as well. And it, it adjusted the exposure automatically. So I took the filter off. It went bright for a moment, but now it's back on, and I did that about two or three, or a couple of minutes, <laughs> but this is real time, so you'll see, uh, to get the diamond ring. And I took it off quite early in that case because I wanted to be ready. And and you can put it on 4K or movie or even 8K now for some cameras, wide, lens wide open at maximum aperture. Uh, I had to stop down and you get some diffraction spikes, which can look okay, but uh, the diamond rings are very demanding of lens quality. I'm getting lens flares there as well, but here it is. Here's the diamond ring in real time, shrinking and shrinking down, and the camera is adjusting. I'm not doing anything to the camera other than having taken the filter off. The camera's running on its own, and now we're down to that last bit of diamond ring, and now that's totality. And and I just let the camera run and drift and it wasn't even tracking the sky as I'll show you. And that's another way, simple way to do it. And you get movies and you get sound and it's a nice way to do it relatively simply uh, as well. And here's another, again, the same example I showed earlier on is from Australia where I had the camera shooting through a telescope on the with the filter at the beginning take the filter off yeah it goes really bright for a second or two but then the auto exposure kicks in and gives you a properly exposed shot it's amazing how well it works but you've got to take the filter off a minute or two before totality to get those diamond rings and just remember to replace it so that way you can get a, a movie which is again you know recording it the way your your eyes saw it and in this case you can just let it drift across the frame you don't have to be tracking the sky that's how much the sun will move over eight minutes sort of two minutes on either side of a four minute long totality in the case of say texas area uh and with a 600 millimeter so quite a long lens so you you would place the sun you figure what out with software where it's going to be, place the sun to the left and just let it drift through the frame. And hopefully if you calculate it right, it'll end up in the center at mid totality. So use planetary software to plan that kind of shot. And you can just once again, get it going initially and just let it run there. And it, and it records the sound, which is really nice to capture. And the other way of doing it with a movie is to shoot with your phone camera. Now, people are, you know, want to take stills, but I think taking a movie, wide angle movie in this case, with your phone camera is a great way to record the eclipse. 
wide angle lens yeah you could zoom in with your telephoto on the phone or whatever but a wide angle your most tele most phone cameras have quite wide lenses now we'll capture the whole scene you know put that behind you and have your family in the foreground in silhouette if there's not a great scenic foreground there and then just get it going on movie mode again a couple of minutes before totality this could be assigned to a family member to you're looking after the phone and get it going on movie mode and it'll record the sound the sound of you getting really excited <laughs> and 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 but just put it on a tripod so don't try don't try to handhold it people will do that but you know no just put it on a tripod so that you can just start record and walk away and just let it run. And again, don't forget to stop it after totality. So that's a very easy way to record the eclipse. Again, the way your eye saw it and the sounds are great as well of your group and the whole crowd where you are, whatever it is, um, is a great way to do it. So I got a couple more tips, but anything anything about movies? Um, not yet. Um <laughs> An interesting comment here from Paul Crowder from England. Paul says, for those romantic guys, propose to your girlfriend during the diamond ring. She'll for sure she'll say yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good good good. Uh, I, I've been at a couple of eclipses where that's happened. But the good advice I heard what was it? Oh, I was Jay Anderson's talk to the Kalamazoo Club last last Friday was don't propose at the first diamond ring. Propose at the second diamond ring. Because otherwise, you propose the first one, you're distracted and you miss the eclipse. <laughs> yeah, <good point. laughs> propose after the second diamond ring or at the second diamond ring. <laughs> Get the yes and the, and the eclipse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. The last couple of tips is, and I've mentioned this already, is practice, practice, practice. You know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice. practice. How do you yeah. get good eclipse pictures? Practice. Don't buy equipment just before the eclipse, just in time for the eclipse that you're not familiar with. Don't assume something will work. We we cobble together combinations of gear for an eclipse that we don't normally use. Okay, fine, but practice with that now. What you intend to use, that it's all going to work, it's all going to aim properly at the sun if it's really high up in the sky where you're going to be, that you can follow it, adjust it properly. It's not going to be shaky whatever your exposures and you can test it on the sun of course with your solar filter but the moon is a good thing we well tonight would be great <laughs> the crescent moon uh with the earth shine because the bright crescent and the dim earth shine is the best stand-in for the bright inner corona and the fainter outer corona so practice with it on the on the crescent moons we only got a couple of them coming up or it could be a waning moon in the morning sky Practice with that, rearing exposures, and 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 can you focus properly? Can you get sharp images operating the camera, not being shaky and not not you know when you're handling the camera? Uh, how long an exposure can you go if you're not tracking before it does blur noticeably? Uh, and so the crescent moon with the earth shine is a very good stand-in for the totally eclipsed sun. Learn to operate your camera by feel if you're needing to adjust things. How many clicks does it go from one stop to the next, whatever. And then practice with it in a hurry in four minutes or in New Brunswick, maybe three minutes, whatever the totality is. Because the eclipse is not going to wait for you. <laughs> you've got to be ready and you've got to get it all done in that three minutes, four minutes, whatever that you've got your program, your sequence, you, whatever your set of shots, your your ambition is to capture, make sure that you can do it. Or adjust, you find out that you know, that's too much, you know, uh, adjust it. And so practice and again and again with it, that's really going to help. And make sure you got all your equipment because the, the next last tip is make your checklists. Uh, and, and this is one out of my ebook here, is make your checklists of, everything that you need if you're at home fine you got everything but if you're traveling you've forgotten some key tripod plate intervalometer cable release whatever some little tiny bit can throw you out i forgot a cable to go from the electronics to the motors 
on my fancy astrophysics mount. So I had no tracking in October 2014. I could still get shots, but it wasn't tracking. So I had this $5,000 mount that was just a tripod. <laughs> it was, and it was dumb, dumb on my part. But but check your, you know, make your list of what it is you're going to need and make sure when you're packing, you're checking it off <laughs> to you know, that you've taken it with you. Uh, you know, your equipment, intervalometers or cables, a spare one is handy because those can break. Uh, filters as well. You got the filters you need, maybe a spare because they can get damaged. Uh, you know, lens adapters if you're using a DSLR lens on a mirrorless camera, tripod plates to attach it to the tripod. That's the kind of thing I've forgotten. You know, power. How are you going to power stuff in the field if you're using a tracking mount? Uh, that the battery is going to work and it's, it's going to last for two, three hours, whatever, uh, four hours needed cables we all know those are the things that go bad you know a cable so having a spare cable uh as well so have spares of those little stupid things that can foul you up and then if something fails just look just don't <laughs> don't panic don't fuss just get the binoculars out get to be the finest view uh, and look at the eclipse plus the naked eye view of what's happening around. Even between the binoculars and naked eye view, you won't take it all in. It's so much going on. It's so immersive. But but that's the experience you want. The photographs are all a bonus. Don't spend so much time, especially if something's going wrong and you're fussing, you're fussing. And I, I, I hear people, oh, I'm going to use a computer to control my camera. And it's going to automate everything. Yeah, and you spend all your time looking at a computer screen. Yeah, and not at the eclipse up there because something will happen wrong with the computer. Windows will decide it wants to update two minutes before the <laughs> <laughs> Don't, you know. So always have a a plan B, B, which is just look, and and it'll be successful if you see it. A bonus tip: I really like this app I used in 2017 from Gordon Telepon. It's the Solar Eclipse Timer. This is really nice to have running on your phone or a tablet or something else that you're not using for photography, and it gives you reminders. It's so much to go, so many minutes to go. Uh, look for shadow bands. I haven't even talked about that. You know, ten seconds to first con, whatever it is, second contact, whatever. Uh, remove filters, um, mid eclipse, uh, 10 seconds, you know, whatever it is, that it's, and you can preview it and rehearse it to give you these prompts to help remind you what to do and what to look for and when things are beginning and when things are ending as well. So that's really handy to have running during your eclipse uh, as well. So that's a, a quick survey of 10 tips here, and I've covered lots more in my ebook. So uh, do check it out if you want to get into a lot more and especially processing eclipse pictures as well. So we can now take any more e questions that we, that we might have as well. And I'll, I'll end my, um, my screen sharing here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, <clears throat> Brad, uh, Brad Perry asks, is the darkness level of the rest of the sky during totality something that can be predicted? in terms of planning a wide shot? <clears throat> no, you can't really predict the darkness. This will be darker eclipse than if you saw 2017, because it's a longer eclipse than in 2017. So you're, the shadow is wider and, and there's less light coming in from outside the shadow. It will be darker than in 2017, um, but it's hard to predict exactly because it depends a lot on your environment and how clear your sky is and, and that sort of, and where you are. It'll be darkest if you're at the center of the path. It'll, it will, you'll, you'll see a brighter horizon in one direction if you're towards the, you know, edge of the path or off center. And don't worry about being dead center in the eclipse path. It's great to be there, but don't worry about go where you're 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 going to get a nice picture, or it's convenient to be, or or um, or, or or where it's clear. So, uh, but but it will be brighter in one direction towards the nearest side of the of where the edge of the shadow is, and that's a very neat effect. That's a beautiful colors as well. There's no predicting. The shorter the eclipse, the brighter the sky. Like here in 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 Pitcairn, this was, I think it was 30 seconds. No, no, a minute. No, this was a minute. So it was a really bright sky. Venus was there, 
And we'll see Venus very prominently and probably Jupiter uh, further away from the sun. No problem. But uh, the other planets, probably not. Yeah, that should be fantastic to see those two for sure. That's amazing in the daytime sky. Um, can you please talk a little bit about ISO speed or aperture? Um, maybe that's been covered through the rest of the talk anyway. Well, I, I didn't mention, <laughs> I, I guess uh, I should have mentioned most, most, Eclipse pictures are best at ISO 100, lowest ISO. The only exception would be if you're shooting without a tracking mount and you want to keep the exposures quite short to avoid blurring and you still want to go for, you know, a, a longer exposure uh, to get corona, you might go up to ISO 400 or 800 perhaps. But I, I wouldn't. I generally shoot at the slowest ISO. The corona is really bright. Uh, and so you don't need a high ISO at all unless you're, say, needing to shoot long exposures without a tracking mount. And you're saying shoot wide open too, Al? Well? Yeah, uh, for the wide angle uh, uh, time lapse stuff, I would shoot wide o, open at 2.8, whatever it might be for your lens, uh, shoot it wide wide open. You could stop it down a bit, but you do have the the problem of something really bright causing diffraction spikes from the iris blades. And so I always shoot well, those kind of shots with the lens wide open. Uh, and even, even your telephoto shots, uh, um, still shots, you, you'd shoot wide open because wide open with the telephoto is probably F4 at best, if not F5, 6. So right. it's not that fast anyway. And so you don't want to stop it down. You're just making the exposure unnecessarily long. Okay. Um, how many cameras do you run during the eclipse, sir? <laughs> <laughs> well, is uh, oh, I I uh, forgot to uh, show the last slide. Um, the the uh, August twenty seventeen was my own ambitious, and that was five cameras, and that was <laughs> ambitious for me. Uh, and but most of them were running on their own. Only the one shooting through the telescope was I actually operating. And and I know people that run like a dozen. Whoa, I don't know how they do it. But yeah. um, and, and I may try that in Texas. It's going to depend a lot on the weather and the site, you know, in terms of um, how much time you have to set up if you've got yeah. to chase at the last minute. Well, right. well, we know you at least had 16 practices, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes and and at some of those all i did like here in in 2005 all i did was the wide angle shot yeah um as well uh oh oh I, oh no i had a movie camera going as well like a videotape camera and it, it didn't work because i forgot to take the filter out and that's <laughs> that's the mistake everybody you have a camera that's kind of running on its own yeah. Well, not quite. You still got to remember to take the I filter. Filmed. Yeah. Well, I like that program that you talked about at the very end uh, about the timer program you can get. It's an app. And when it tells you take your filter off, put your filter back on that whole thing. Like that's And then, and then I think it said on the bottom, I, mean, I don't know if you read it or not, but there's actually practice runs you can do with that, with that yeah. <laughs> the built in timing system on that app. So that app would actually be fantastic. Yeah. yeah, Gordon's done a really nice job on that. And so check that out. And he's got a website and he's got an ebook as well. Uh, it's very good. Uh, that's mostly about the visual experience, uh, not so much about photography, but it's it's great. But the app is excellent. And he has just revised it, the app in conjunction with Fred Espinac to have a photo mode where the 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 uh, reminders are more geared to photography than right. the visual experience. I kind of like the visual prompts because I like to be able to look for the shadow bands and look around. It reminds you to look around at mid totality. You might forget that. So I like the visual prompts. You know, I got, I, I figured out what I want to do for photographically, but you can get so wrapped up in that you forget what it is to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of great information. Unbelievable. And I know that's just a snippet of what you got in your, in your course. So uh, so for those who really want to um, progress in the solar uh, eclipse uh, imaging, uh, check out Alan's course on his line, on his site rather. And um, wow. And also go on his site and get a free calendar. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, yeah. If you if you go to the main books page, there's a free calendar PDF you can download. 
uh, as well, and um, uh, that you have to print out, but it's a free yeah, channel yeah. PDF. Yeah, yeah great, some really, really nice shots on that too and stuff. So, all right, well, that's great, Alan. I don't know how to say thank you enough. Uh, whoops, my camera just fell from Tap. <laughs> there we go. We're all here. We're We're out of there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> set that. there we go. So, uh, thank you so, so much uh, for this, Alan. Um, we're all excited about the upcoming eclipse. And I think this uh, this really uh, started off the new year uh, heading towards that eclipse in an absolutely positive and, and exciting way. So, uh, uh, again, uh, thank you so much for, for doing this. Yeah, You're welcome. And thank you for the invitation to, to speak. I, I, I watch your show fairly often on Sunday nights. And, uh, oh, finally, I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's our pleasure. Uh, it, was, it was awesome to have you on here. Uh, and some great tips. People don't forget that the, the show is still uh, over live right now. It is recorded, so you can go back on, on YouTube and find us uh, again to go through all those great tips that Alan had offered, as well as Facebook. It's, it'll be up on Facebook as well uh, for as long as I have a Facebook account, so there. <laughs> it's always up, and uh, if you have any other questions that you'd like me to pass on, Alan, please just pass them on to me through my, uh, PM me through my page, and I can get uh, get back in touch. Um you know, we're all looking forward to an amazing event. Uh, Paul says, uh, yes, don't forget to enjoy the experience of the event and those of the people around you as well. Um, and uh, now uh, Paul Gray had said, uh, he made, made a comment here too. Where is he at here? In 2017, I put my DSLR with my fisheye lens behind where my family was set up and recorded the video. So we have a video of the, of the sky darkening and our reactions during the eclipse. Great memory. So yeah, I mean, it is all about the visual experience, right? Uh, it was 9.32, apparently, the last time that it passed over to Brunswick in that particular pattern. So we're talking about a little while ago. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we probably won't be around for the next one uh, for that pattern to, to pass over. So, you know, enjoy the event as much as possible. And just remember that, you know, it's it's a magical thing that's happening. It's it's one of the most magical things that you can imagine in the cosmos that we can we can appreciate, uh, in my opinion, anyway, the, the, the biggest celestial event of your lifetime. So, Alan, uh, such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Please know that you're welcome to come back anytime at all. We'd love to have you back on the program to talk again. Um, so, I'm, thank I'm, you. We're going to sign I'll, off. I'll stick That's... around here for. I'll stick around here for a bit. Awesome. Right. Good. Um, so, we're going to sign off here tonight. Uh, so, a special thanks again, of course, to Alan for joining us this evening. Uh, uh, we hope that you enjoyed the program tonight. Uh, and uh, what's up next week? Well, next week. What is next week? Next week is our 200th episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, two. 200 <laughs> episodes. Unbelievable that you people have put up with us that long. <laughs> well, especially me. But, uh, yeah, so we're going to we're gonna uh, hope that you join us uh, next weekend. We're going to celebrate a little bit about uh, being with you now since, I guess, 2019. It's been, it's been a long go. Um, we took a short break last summer, but uh, really we've been pretty well straight through since then. Remember, we did start the program saying that we were going to try to offer live views of celestial objects, and that's what the show was going to be. And uh, in that four years that we were running the show, we had three clear nights on a Sunday night that weren't summertime that we could actually offer something. So we, we progressed <laughs> into this, but it's, we're so happy that we've got into the fact that we're inviting guests on now, and they're joining us, and we're having great talks and uh, great information. So the big event, of course, is coming up on April the 8th, so just keep your mind focused on that. This is going to be big no matter where. You are in the path. All of North America will get at least some view, right? Some portion of the view. So uh, let's focus on that. So two, remember too, we do love getting your photos. And although we didn't get a chance to show them tonight, I'm going to hang on to them until next week. So we'll have a, a nice big patch of them to show next week. Uh, and so send them into astronomybythebay at gmail.com. We'll be happy to share them on the next broadcast. And uh, I guess that's probably all I got to say. Is that is that all I got to say? It might be all I got to say. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, did, what did Can you work? imagine? What did Forrest Gump say? <laughs> That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> so, um, as we like to say, guys, uh, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes pointed up, everybody. Pointed up. Thank you again, Alan. Appreciate it. And uh, wishing everybody clear skies. Take care, everyone. And we'll sign out with this screen, maybe. Well, I hope I didn't go on too long there to <laughs> screw up your program. No problem. So like.